it's so difficult to transition because everybody gets pigeonholed. But somehow you found a way to say, nope, this is what I'm going to do next and here's how I'm going to do it. So talk to me about some of these major bank benchmarks and transitions that you've made throughout your career. Yeah, I, I think, Zach, the total of it and stepping back a little bit, the total of it is being able to identify opportunity and being prepared for that opportunity. That's where the hard work thing comes in. So when the hard work and the opportunity came together, it usually was a game-changing moment. I'm here today with award-winning editor and director James Wilcox. He has worked on such hit shows as, I'm gonna have to take a big deep breath here, <gasps> Dark Angel, My Wife and Kids, Reno 911, Everybody Hates Chris, CSI Miami, Hawaii Five O, Roots, Genius, Raising Dion, and your current project, which is Hillbilly Elegy. And you have worked with some of Hollywood's most legendary directors, including James Cameron, Chris Columbus, Mario Van Peebles, and most recently now, Ron Howard. I'm exhausted already, and we barely <laughs> just got started, James. I, and I've only gotten through the first half, by the way. I think the rest of this is really important for the, for the conversation. I, I found it funny, and it tells me a lot about a person when I ask for their brief introduction and then their bio. And I thought, oh, he must have mistakenly put his bio in the brief intro. But there's so much to cover that it's in the brief <laughs> one. And I, I'm just going to finish because I think it's so important to convey all of this for today's conversation. So in addition to being a director and an editor, you are an Emmy, an Ace Award winning uh, editor. You've been named to Variety Magazine's coveted Artisans Elite. You're a member of the ATAS, the, Ameri the Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, MPEG's Diversity Committee, the African American Steering Committee, the DGA, and you're a lecturer and mentor. And my friend, I talk to everybody all the time about time management and how we all have the same amount of 24 hours a day and seven days a week but I'm pretty sure you're cheating and you have an eight day week and a 30 hour day because how you've accomplished all of this is beyond me, but that's what we're going to talk about. And my God, is it a pleasure to have you here today? Thank you, Zach, for having me. That's, that's a lot. That's quite an intro. I, I, you know, don't really do a lot of looking back on my career because I'm usually too busy trying to plan and find my next job and manage my life and uh, keep everything in order so that I'm in balance. So I'm able to do all these things that we just kind of talked about and having a great steady home life makes the difference. It's well, all about the support I have at home to be able to do all these things. And clearly that's what I want to talk about in great detail is how in the world are you able to be so accomplished despite the fact that we only have a certain number of hours in the day or days in the week, everything else that's going on in the world, you've basically said, well, I'm, I'm going to figure it out somehow. And you and I have talked offline, off the record about uh, some of your journey. And to me, it is so inspiring the things that you have decided to pursue, the things that you have overcome in the process. So I really want people to know that at the end of this conversation, it's not just about your story. It's also about the mindset that you had going into all the things that you wanted to pursue and accomplish. But in order to understand the mindset, we have to understand the person better and we have to understand the story. So you, my friend, are a very good storyteller. And I want to understand more about your story. And the place to begin today is talk to me about the guy that wanted to become a baseball player and decided, you know what, maybe I want to be an editor or a filmmaker instead. What's that all about? So let's, let's start there with your interests as a, as a uh, younger child and deciding which path I wanted to take in life. Well, I'll tell you this, Zach. One of the ways that I'm able to accomplish a lot during my day is it starts with my parents. They got us out of bed super early. I'm the youngest of four, and no matter what, it's just, you know, some people I think are born with internal earlier clocks, and some people are night hawks. And I happen to be a person who really uh, enjoys the quiet of the morning when everybody's sleeping and, and, and like not hearing a lot of traffic and hearing the birds and all the things, the qualitative things I'm able to get done early on. So I start my day very early, sometimes 5.30, sometimes 6. I get up, I work out, I have a little breakfast, and I'm ready to nestle into whatever the day holds. You know, so starting work early. And then by the time I'm done, which usually is about, it can be up to 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10, whatever it is. But I never feel so exhausted because I feel like I've accomplished a lot. I've packed a lot. And I've watched other people who lead much busier lives than myself as examples on how they're able to squeeze so much into their work day, their home life, and the whole thing. So going back, I, you know, I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. And uh, one of the things that we were taught in Pittsburgh, uh, or certainly in my family, was 
you have to work hard for what you want in life. And so I have a very hard working ethic about everything that I've set out to do because it's brought me everything that I've been able to experience in my life. And I was taught early on, learned a great lesson that shortcuts didn't kind of work for me. Some people were able to take things easier. I was an athlete growing up, played a lot of baseball. There were kids that the game came much naturally, much more natural to. I was one of the ones who I had talent and skill, but I needed to work at it because if I wanted to compete against the very best, which I've carried over for just about everything else in my life, I figured hard work was gonna be the way to do it, that no one could outwork me. Everybody wasn't born with the same skill set. everybody wasn't as gifted, but what would begin to separate us was who was trained, who worked hard, who took their talents for granted, and that was something that I never ever wanted to do was just consider myself mailing it in. So that's kind of how I, I approach my, my work day and how I'm, I, I like to stay busy. And I also like meeting new people and doing new things. So that, that's a big part of it. I want to dive a little bit deeper into this transition that you made from being an athlete to wanting to play baseball to being a filmmaker. But the one thing that I want to really extract from what you said right away, and maybe this is going to take us down a totally different rabbit hole, and we don't even talk about that transition for half an hour. I don't know. But it's a very potentially dangerous thing to say, no one can outwork me. That's a lot of what's gotten us in such trouble in this industry in the first place is the idea that we believe that we are machines that can work ourselves into the ground. So I very much appreciate the work ethic, but as I'm sure you know from working in this industry for so long, it's a very fine line between, between no one can outwork me, but I'm still going to take care of myself versus nobody can outwork me no matter what, whatever the detriment might be. So how, how do you find the balance if you say no one's going to outwork me, but you're also talking about seeing your family and you're at a standing desk and you take care of yourself and you're clearly in very good shape. So where do you find that line? You, you just have to find it. I mean, exercise is a big part of myself. And I have to tell you this, too, as you're talking about no one out, can outwork me. And that's my part of my ethic. But at the same time, I've actually gotten myself physically ill from that same thing, that same thing that's been a, been, been a gift to me has oftentimes been, um, you know, a curse as well, because it's like someone who doesn't have a certain pain threshold and they go too far and then the pain occurs and they realize, oh, now I'm in, I'm in it now. And um, so that's, that's all I really know. It's kind of how I'm built, but the, it's, it's the balance of it. Work hard, play hard. I should have told you that too, that exercise, I love it. It, it keeps me balanced. It keeps me healthy. It, you know, I'm really proud of, I, I don't get sick very often. And that has a lot to do with uh, the, the supplements that I take. I do work, but I play hard too. So uh, when a vacation is, is in order or uh, going to a movie or going to see a play or taking in uh, a sporting event or just chilling with the family, whatever it is, I'm there 100% with that too. And so, you know, going back a little bit about how I transitioned myself from my desire, my, my, my childhood dream to become a baseball player, I actually had a couple dreams going up. And um, when I was younger, my mom used to always tell me stories about how my dad was in medical school and then he got drafted in the army and he went to Korean War and he wasn't one to talk about his life a whole lot. So I mostly heard some of those stories through her. So um, I thought, you know what? Kids want to be like their dad. I thought, I'll, maybe I'll go to medical school. And I had that in mind. I also had baseball player in mind. Any time a teacher would write down, what's your goal in life? What's your dream? I just put down baseball player and doctor. I had two of them. And the doctor part of it worked out really well until I got to about eighth grade when we started doing dissections in my biology class. And we started with the worms, pinning them back and identifying the organs and, and, and making these careful dissective cuts and everything like that. Great, I could do that. But I did notice that the smell of formaldehyde just made me gag. Oh boy. And I thought, okay, well, this is just the worms. We'll see how the next thing go. We progressed up the frogs. I go, okay, this is a little bit more intense because now I can actually see the organs. And I don't know if I like this, you know, I'm kind of half doing it right. And um, so then we had a field trip one day to the Pittsburgh city morgue. 
And that was a real eye opener because we went in the morgue. We didn't see any bodies per se. They were all covered, but they opened up the freezer and they said, this is what happens to various people for different reasons. There's people that we found who've passed on the street. There's people who have died from various illnesses and diseases. And the coroner's office, they had these huge jars, which you've seen before, of how all the organs of the body can fit into essentially a jar. And But the difference was those jars were the diseased ones. So you saw what the lungs should look like, and then you saw someone who smoked for a lifetime and died and their lungs were just like black. And I saw that and I was like, I don't think I can do this. I'm, and in <laughs> fact, I'm pretty sure I, I can't do this. Let's go twice as hard at the baseball thing. And, uh, and, and I was a good baseball player all throughout my youth and into high school and into college. And um, when I got to college, I needed to pick a major. So I chose liberal arts. Within liberal arts, I really enjoyed photography. And within photography, I just I understood that there was storytelling within the photography, if you chose to do that. There are point and shoot subjects, but then there are subjects of really compelling people in their lives, and you just want to know more about them. And so I would take my camera out and just photograph various people without their permission, mostly, just kind of get candid shots of different lifestyles and just wondering, I wonder what this person's story was. And it was for a class, so I never really approached them to get the full story. I brought it back to one of my professors and they looked and we developed my photography. photography. So, so after I brought it back to one of my, my, my professors, we had an overview of my photography and he really was encouraging. He goes, you really understand what this is about. And I didn't think anything more of it. I go, yeah, I enjoy doing it. And you know, he was encouraging the whole thing. And um, so this was still in Pennsylvania. And I was playing baseball there, and I know that I needed to play more baseball, 20 games more, um, which meant going to a warmer climate. So I transferred down to Atlanta, Georgia, and went to a school, uh, Clark College, which is now Clark Atlanta University. And that's really where I got my first exposure in deeply into mass communications, broadcast, journalism, television, film, but my emphasis was really in television. So from there, I got an internship with CNN in their sports department. So here's a guy who's fascinated by storytelling and television and also fascinated with athletics and sports. And I land an internship at CNN in their sports department. So that was two things that came naturally to me. Wonderful opportunity. And what I learned there was this could be a real interest of mine going forward. The hours were long, they were demanding, the people I worked with were exacting, and it just came easier for me. So I knew at that point I had the stomach, so to speak, for uh, editing. I didn't get on the equipment very much, um, and it wasn't until my second inter internship. I got my second internship at the CBS affiliate there. It was WAGA at the time, and that internship was paid. But you basically were a low salaried employee because they wanted you to do everything. I went out with camera crews. I would go down to the various sports teams, throw a mic in their, in, in their face and ask them about uh, what happened up there. Your last at bat, come back, write the copy for the story, uh, hand it over to the anchor. He would look at it, proof it. This is great. I've cut the highlights. Um, and then we'd go from there. And next thing you know, I would see my work. My, my evenings work on the 11 o'clock news. And it was, it was pretty fascinating. So the path then from you've got this young kid in Pittsburgh as far away from you can get as you can get from the, the Hollywood atmosphere and the, the film lifestyle and the, the industry. And you're primarily an athlete. You decide, you know what, there's something to this media thing. So I find my way in the door in the, the media broadcast side of things with sports. But then from there to I'm editing tentpole feature films with Ron Howard, if somebody were to look at your resume, they'd say, what in the world? Like, what's going on? There's, it's, it's not a logical path. There are so many different genres and mediums and short form and long form and broadcast, and it seems nearly impossible in this day and age to be able to do that. So one thing I'm really curious about that I want to talk more are these major transitions, because as I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum in many of these committees and it, um, all the things that you're involved with, that it's so difficult to transition because everybody gets pigeonholed. But somehow you found a way to say, nope, 
this is what I'm going to do next and here's how I'm going to do it. So talk to me about some of these major bank benchmarks and transitions that you've made throughout your career. Yeah, I, I think, Zach, the total of it and stepping back a little bit, the total of it is being able to identify opportunity and being prepared for that opportunity. That's where the hard work thing comes in. So when the hard work and the opportunity came together, it usually was a game changing moment. So while I had that internship, I did transition eventually from sports because one of the staff news editors left. They had been watching me. I didn't know that. I've had a life of a lot of people watching me and spotting something in me that I was thinking about something else and couldn't see in my own self. So they had been watching me because they hired a lot from within. And when they did that and the, and the staff editor left, the supervising editor came to me and he says, we want you on the news side. And I thought, but I love sports. He goes, no, 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 you, you, you'll learn to love news. This is way more important. And he was right. You know, he gave me a lot of pointers, really took me under his wing and mentored me. One of my very first professional mentors. I've had a lot. Uh, in my life from family members to just people who say things to you that they just stick with you and you connect with them and you know that this is advice that you can carry for forward for a lifetime. And so the guy really took me under his wing. He showed me exactly how to cut, what made difference in the cut. And he gave me an exercise. When I first started, he said, look, I want you to go home and you're going to look at four commercials and you're going to come back and I want you to have your television down and you're gonna tell me what those commercials were trying to communicate in their 30 second airtime. And then I'll know these commercials cause I'm gonna watch them and I'm gonna to listen to them with the sound up and let's see how well you understood the sort of nonverbal storytelling of it all. And I came back, gave him my thoughts on the various commercials and he goes, he watched, oh, it took about like two weeks or something. He finally watched them all and he goes, you get this. You get this. I, I'd love to have you as part of our team. So that was one of the first big opportunities. Then once I got in there, you know, I'm I'm kind of a twitchy guy, <laughs> twitchy guy a little bit at times. And so um, my speed and like just how I process things was was really a great asset in the news business because the three things skills that you really need, Zach, speed, creativity, and accuracy to become a good solid news editor. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was actually honing my skills for bigger opportunities down the road. So eventually, as I moved through that system, I got to a point where two years in, um, I wasn't making very much money, but I was happy with what I was doing. But I did realize now after school, I needed a little bit more money. I went in, asked for a raise, and um, the news director at the time, his name was Andy Fisher, he goes, James, let me see what I can do. And I waited week two weeks later, almost three weeks later, and I thought, I'm probably not going to get a raise. So I go back in and he says, come on in and uh, let's sit down and talk about the raise. And he gave me a raise. It was nominal. It was really not anything that I thought, I'm gonna, probably going to have to leave. Well, right about that time, there was a fellow news editor who left to go up to New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, work in that tri-state area. And the place where he was working at, which was called Satellite News Channel at the time, was supposed to be a rival to CNN and the other like 24-hour news services. But he ended up uh, connecting me with the people there and I was able to leave Atlanta. So that was the first big break. As I went in to resign, that news director, his last words were to me, well, I'm not gonna be here forever either. So let's make sure that we stay in touch. And I thought, bet, I'd love to do that. You know, this guy's been great for me. He hired me. He taught me uh, a lot and told me why he hired me, gave me a lot of confidence. So it's just about spotting opportunity. And from there, once I got uh, up to New York and Connecticut and working in that area, he called me like a year and a half later, almost two years later. And he said, James, I'm a news director out at, uh, at the time it was KNXT, which has now become KCBS. And he says, uh, you know, we have an opening out here. Why don't you come out to California, take a look at it, see what you think. And I'm like, what is there to look at? I, I don't, at, my, at, at that point, it was 13 inches of snow on the ground in New York, dead of winter, like in the middle of February. And I thought to myself, I'm on it. So I fly out to LA. I had never been west of the Mississippi. I come out and everything is just in stark, colorful contrast to what to the way it was back east. Everything was brown and gray and the snow and slushy and ice. And you grew up in Michigan, so you know what it's like. And 
And I went out here and there were palm trees and the sunsets were gorgeous and it was this burnt orange sunset. And I go in the interview and they walk me through and I could tell that they really wanted to hire me off of his recommendation. So I, as soon as I saw that, I go, well, just don't say anything stupid and you probably will get this. And before I left to get back on the plane, at the end of that day, it was a long day. They took me around everywhere. It was like a full day interview. Basically what they did is they showed me a day in the life of an editor at the station. And they were observing me just to see how I would work out and what I thought and the whole thing. And I did a lot of listening and they hired me and I worked there for, for nine years. And that was another big game changing opportunity. And eventually I became the supervising editor at CBS for the first three years. I was there establishing myself. I thought, wow, I'm going to Los Angeles. I'm going to be working with all these senior editors. And I got there and I knew way more than I thought. And I was better than I thought. And I was like, I'm able to compete with the people who are here who are considered the best. And then eventually over the next three years, I was considered the best there. So I was in demand. And over the last three years, I thought, you know what, this is great, um, but there has to be more. And I started preparing myself for life after CBS. And boy, when I, when I told people I was leaving this great corporate CBS job, people looked at me like, you are insane. Do you know what you're doing? And um, so right around that time, the technology and the industry was changing. Avid was emerging and it was stable. And it was one, and, and then I left CBS and I went on to a show at Fox where they had like 14, 15 Abbots and 14, 15 editors who really didn't know the Abbot. So it was perfect. <laughs> so we're all learning on the job and sharing information together. Another game changing opportunity to stay up with the technology. I did that for a while and I thought, what more is after this? Maybe I'll, I'll go into the scripted world because I've been, been doing a lot of unscripted work here and I knew I wasn't ready to go into the scripted world and as I told you, I went and got myself in the Beverly Hills Playhouse and I studied acting for two and a half, three years. And it taught me how to break down the scene. It taught me the actor's intentions. It taught me what the what what overall the scene could be as opposed to the way it was written. And it really taught me if I was ever going to go into the direct how to speak to an actor, the active language that an actor relates to, the emotive language that an actor relates to, other than saying, well, this time you need to be happy. Well, what does happy mean? You know, at what point should I show that happiness in this scene? So that was another big opportunity that helped really fortify my future. I didn't know a lot of these things that I'm doing, I'm feeling my way through it. Mind you, as I've come through this whole um, journey from becoming a sports editor to a news editor to then going freelance to then being in this playhouse along the way i never really went to film school and i thought did i miss a step here but life was going fine and i had bought a house and i was paying for a mortgage and so now i have responsibilities and i thought well i'm still learning i'm still advancing then i got enough hours to join the union and i joined the union and i paid dues uh for six years without ever getting a union job I barely got an interview, but I was working and I was fine. And I'm like, I'm preparing myself and it'll happen one day. And eventually I got an interview over at Paramount with this guy, Harold Harrison, who, had, who was the head of post-production over there. And Brian Bradford, who was like a VP over there. And they really, um, I told them what I was interested in doing, cutting a show. And they must've thought this guy's really bold. He's never been an assistant editor. He's never been in the studio system. He's not out of film school. He's been cutting a lot of stuff that maybe we've heard of, maybe we haven't, but he's boldly declaring he's ready to work on a studio and a network show. Um, but I thought it was kind of bold, but they took me seriously. And they then called me back in and offered me assistant editor's job on, I think it was like Cheers or one of those shows. Ron Volk was the editor. And I said, I'll take that job if you think that Ron will allow me to cut so I can show him what I can do. And of course they couldn't promise anything like that from studio level about an editor who's an award-winning edit, multi-award-winning editor. Um, and so they called me back eventually and between that opportunity and, uh, and along the way, I'd met another friend of mine who I call a friend and a mentor. 
and he's shocked when I call him a mentor. His name's Monty DeGraff, who's a fabulous editor and a great person all around. And, and frankly, the reason that you and I are on the microphone today that's was right. it all started when I talked to Monty. Monty's worked with somebody else that knows you. They talk to you. So Monty's the one that starts all of this. He's responsible for all of it. So I'm going I'm to give him kudos. Didn't mean to interrupt, but I want to I throw out kudos to him and uh, let you continue. Well deserved. We're all six degrees away from Monty yeah, DeGraff. Right? I like and, that. That's uh, a new game. Six degrees from Monty. <laughs> yeah. Kevin Bacon's yesterday. Yeah, it's six out. degrees from Monty today. Agreed. But, you know, we, we would see each other at, we had a mutual friend who was an actor who would throw these wonderful Christmas parties every year. And it would be a chance for us to catch up, talk shop a little bit, have our wives talk a little bit. And uh, so he knew I was really trying to transition over into the scripted world. Well, he became the supervising editor on this TV show, my very first one that I worked on, Soul Food, that was patterned after the movie for Showtime. And uh, I went in, the request was, um, they were looking for someone who was good with music and was a good storyteller. And I went in, talked to them, they believed in me, and that's really how I got the next huge break. Because when, I, when they were looking for someone who was good with music, Along the way, I had worked with MTV, I had worked with VH1. Those were all those sort of music doc driven shows. So I could cut my own music. I wasn't just considered a picture editor. And, um, and it just, you know, for them, I was the right guy at the right time. So those two showrunners, Felicia Henderson and Kevin Arkadai, they hired me on the spot there. And it was amazing because that's when I finally went through that passage of getting into the scripted world and with so much to learn. And it's funny too, because my very first director I worked with was Kevin Hooks. And one of the last directors I worked with in television was Kevin Hooks. So, and he doesn't even really remember. And I, and I said to him, Kevin, do you remember I cut your first episode? And he kind of was like, yeah, 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 yeah. He didn't remember, I'm pretty sure of it. But, um, you know, that was, you know, so, so I guess what is the reoccurring theme in a lot of this, and I'll continue forward, you know, about how I had now have gotten to cut with Ron Howard. It's kind of being ready, not being told to get ready, but readying myself with the idea of don't give anyone a reason to tell you no, and whatever you don't know, go learn it, work hard at it, continue to develop your craft, your skills, keep them high. Um, and just and just when an opportunity comes, who knows when and where it's going to come, but be prepared for it. And yeah. so that's kind of my lesson. And I would say that the, the big one to pull out of that is the idea of never putting yourself in a position for somebody to say no. You yeah. said uh, a little while ago, you're like, well, I was just the right guy at the right time. Huh. It sure sounds like you got lucky, right? And anybody that's listened to my show on a regular basis knows that I think that luck is a four-letter word. Never use the word lucky because if you want to be quote unquote lucky, well, that's just the intersection of your hard work and someone else's opportunity at the same time. So I don't believe that you were just the right guy at the right time and it was luck. I believe you made yourself the right guy by spending years honing your skills to be the right guy. And then when the right time came, you created those opportunities. Because anybody can listen to your story up to now and say, wow, there are a lot of lucky breaks for this guy. Getting this job and this interview and working here and the guy in California calling him and saying we've got a job for you. Boy, none of that's going to ever happen to me. Like, I'm, not, I'm never going to be lucky like James. And on top of it, I've been doing news for nine years and I've just been told like it, it's too late. It's too late for me to, to make the transition and do what I really want to do in scripted TV or music videos or trailers. Like, I should have made that decision a long time ago. And you, you've proved that that's very, very wrong because I, I think we've only covered maybe half the genres that you've, you've worked in so far, right? 30 yeah. minutes in, there's so many things we haven't even touched upon yet. But I think to, to stop it uh, where we are here and like you said, to, to really talk about the themes, you made sure you were the right guy and you made sure you were in the right place at that right time. Yeah, no, no question about it. And I don't mean to give, misrepresent myself as being this happy-go-lucky guy. It's all, it all's built on a foundation of, of preparation meeting opportunity and, um, and winning the people over in the room and having them believe in me that, you know, you're committed. We can see you're committed because we see your resume. We see how passionate you are in the room. And that's something that we would like to have as a part of our team.
So yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent myself as being someone who's, you know, had a four leaf clover in their back pocket all through their career because there were setbacks. I'm just giving you the highlights. Sure. Um, you know, so yeah. Well, I also think that statistically, it would be pretty hard for somebody to say, well, you got all the breaks. Because if we're talking about the math of it all, especially given everything that's going on in society and in the industry, you're part of the 1% of people in post-production that's African-American. So for anybody to say, oh, yeah, well, he just got all the breaks. Like, uh, no, I'm pretty sure that not only did you have to work just as hard as anybody else that might have gotten where you are. And by the way, there's very, very few people left at your level. Like you're at the, the highest of the high. You, it was probably significantly harder for you to be able to do the same things. So to, to get through this journey, we haven't even gotten to the, the present yet. But just for the journey that we've talked about so far, were there any barriers that you felt, whether it was from being from Pittsburgh and not from L.A. or um, the, the color of your skin or anything that was making it even harder where you just said, you know what, it doesn't matter as long as I work hard and as long as I make sure I don't I don't give anybody the opportunity to say no to me. Yeah. You know, my dad used to teach if you're thorough, you can't be denied. That's what he would say. Now, having said that, that can be a cliche or that can be a reality. It depends on how much you want to put into that thought process. So yeah, there were times I was greatly discouraged because I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me. And growing up, I didn't know anyone involved with television. The only person I knew involved with television was this man, Mr. McKnight, that used to come to the house when our TV went out. <laughs> That's a guy that I knew in television who would repair them. That's nice. it. And, and, and even when I got into college and I was telling people I was interning at different TV stations and the whole thing like that, they thought I was talking about what he did, repairing TVs, not working and telling stories as an editor. And for years, my mom introduced me as a writer, uh, a producer. She, she didn't understand what I did as an editor. So, yeah, I mean, the whole idea of, um, you know, this dot on the map where I started from to where I am was a, oftentimes a very lonely journey. So I chose to not really pity myself, but look at it as one of pioneering and helping to create a path for people that may come behind me. Now, I didn't do this all by myself. I had a lot of mentors along the way, and I should have mentioned more of them who just took a keen understanding and recognizing that I was dedicated, I had some talent, I had a drive, and that they would help me get to the next place. And it was very discouraging. Those six years where I paid union dues, and I would go to events and I wouldn't see hardly any African-American people. And I just would feel so lonely in those rooms because I was up and coming. I didn't have credits that they could recognize from me. And it was just, it was really brutal. Even now, I mean, I don't want to make that seem like a thing in the past. We're talking about 1%. I don't want to make it seem like that's a thing of the past. We're talking of past. We're talking about 1% of our over 8,000 member Motion Picture Editors Guild being of African-American descent. And that includes all the different classifications, sound editors, picture editors, mixers, the whole thing. And so um, it, it, it's been tough, but you know, that's my life. That's what's been put in front of me. Um, and so I welcome the opportunity to be a shining example when I'm where I can for other people that are just, you know, traditionally not on the Hollywood track. I didn't grow up with any, anybody that I knew in this business at all. Um, and it has been difficult. And I, and I have to tell you, I, I don't really have one horror story or a series of horror stories about call, being called out of my name or anything like that. I'll tell you the more stories that are a little bit more interesting to me, that when we have common group lunches and a lot of the people that I work with, non-Black or whatever, um, they, maybe sometimes our conversation will veer off on a cross-country drive to go, uh, you name it, you know, just some cross-country drive to go out to the Dakotas to see Mount Rushmore. Let's just say that. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I don't know, man, as an African-American, there's a lot of hostile places that I would be subject to traveling through. And it's kind of like, you know, the movie Green Book, which is what Green Book represents, although the movie didn't illustrate that part of it. But there were these towns traditionally called sun, sundown towns where black people, you could not be there by the time the sun goes down or it was just going to be hell to pay. So I think about things like that 
where I don't think my counterparts have ever considered that. They might consider, well, the worst that can happen for me maybe is the engine goes out, the tire blows, I get a speeding ticket. I think about all those things. And in addition to that, being African-American out on a lonely highway with my family, vulnerable to law enforcement or some crazies or some bigoted person or something like that. Um, so those are the kinds of things. But as it relates to the industry, yeah, um, I'm right now going a thousand percent hard to see to it that I can bring other people along. Uh, who've traditionally have had to work really twice as hard and they've not been in recognition of an opportunity. Well, I think that one of the things that uh, our industry has done a good job, not a great job, and hopefully we can start doing a much better job of it, but over the last 20 or 30 years, I grew up with a lot of movies like Green Book and many others, Remember the Titans, all these movies that are bringing to light what was happening in earlier decades. But as you grow up, you think, oh my God, I can't believe those things happened. Right. Yeah. You don't think to yourself they're still happening. Yeah. And we've developed this hyper awareness over the last few months. Oh, wait a second. None of this is not only not fixed. It might actually be worse than it used to be, but we weren't aware of it. And in the entertainment industry, we have a huge responsibility to continue telling those stories and have the right people telling those stories. So I have a podcast that I'm going to be recording with three students uh, that are black that are either still in school or some of them that have recently graduated talking about what this journey looks like now from the beginning because statistically there's so much attrition for minorities and people of color because they get into the industry, they're super excited, super exuberant, I'm gonna tell my stories, but they just get so beaten down by the system. And like you said, it's not necessarily just overt racism or discrimination. You just walk into a room and you're like, I'm here on my own. Like, yeah. I've got no friends, I've got no allies. So I know that you're part of multiple diversity committees, committees and mentorship committees. What can we do to bring more people in from the ground up and not just say we need more people of diversity and color that are the head uh, executives at Netflix or wherever, all of which is important. But I believe to really tell these stories, we need a lot of people coming in from the ground up as well. And I'm not as ingrained or intertwined with these discussions or these developments, but I'd really like to know what can we all do to foster this? I think we all got to take a deep, long look at ourselves and go, how do we get better? How do we make this better? How do we have sustainable, actionable, long-term generational change? Because I've seen these movements and moments happen, although this one I think is different because I've never seen the global outrage. I've never seen the huge racial outrage. For the first time, I'm really seeing a lot of what I would call our allies, our white allies, our, our, our brown allies, all those people who are now coming together collectively to say, this is wrong. This has to change. So with that in mind, there is a bit of an awakening and then a bit of awareness, a rapid awakening that's going on right now. Maybe it's due to COVID-19, people being at home. I'm just not sure what it is. But the George Zimmerman murder, to see that happen, uh, I'm sorry, I said George Zimmerman. I meant George Floyd. He stays on my mind too. But George Floyd murder, to witness that, it's just, it's unbelievable, a brutal murder like that. So how do we in the industry do what we can do? I think we got to hit it on multiple levels. There's kids in high school classrooms right now that are involved in media and cinema and television and storytelling. That's one thing that we have, we have to, as members of our guild and members of this industry, begin to expose ourselves to these people because they wouldn't see anyone like me. So they shouldn't have to have the same lon lonely journey that I had that I might be able to go into a classroom and they see somebody who looks like them and they go, ah, this is possible. I like what this guy's doing. I've just been doing this at home on my own and my cell phone and on my own premiere or whatever setup it is. I've been doing all of this stuff, but I didn't know it was possible to have a long career in it and what that career means and all the opportunities and exposures that can come out of it. So from the high school level to the college classroom level to uh, many of these groups of African-Americans and other people of color, diverse groups that are out there, they need support now for transitioning to where it is they're trying to guide their and architect their careers to go. So there's people in the unscripted world that are trying to get into scripted. There's people in the scripted world that are trying to elevate into premium television. There's people in premium television that just want an opportunity to maybe cut a feature. So um, for me, 
I, I hope that my voice carries some weight in that regard, that they can see that it's possible because my advantage is I've done all of those things from news to drama, to comedy, to unscripted material, to commercials, music videos, and now I'm cutting features. So um, yeah, I think that's what has to happen. And also, you know, it's it's just this is just one part of it societally speaking there's so many sy systemic barriers we have to legislatively begin to knock down and that means full participation from all of us and whatever we can do from voting to writing letters to your representatives to uh going to kathy rapola and saying i have an idea that i'd like to share with you that i think can help move the needle forward for a long-term sustained generational change so that we're not talking about these same issues 20 years later and guess what by the time we go back and visit the numbers on this next year we need to see growth we need to measure, we need a metric that says, this has not just been lip service. This has not just been a token movement in, a, in, a, in, a, in, the, in the compendium of life that there has been real significant change that we can point to that the year 2020 was one of those sparks of, and again, for me, you talk about game changing moments. This has the opportunity to be that. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the key point here is what you measure, you improve upon. Yeah. It's one thing to say, well, this is the movement now, and I'm just going to say, yeah, of course we should support this. But can we actually look back and look quantifiably, have we made a difference? And I think one of the important things that you said that really didn't occur to me before, uh, before all of these things were happening, and I now realized is so important, which is one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show and discuss and just tell your story, right? It wasn't about how do we get into like a really deep racial discourse for an hour or that. It's just making sure that your story is available and out there. And the reason it's so important was this. I, I'm going to paraphrase because I'm going off, the, going off memory, and I've received maybe over a 1,000 Facebook comments and messages in the last three or four weeks uh, with the combination of the article that I wrote about things in Hollywood not working and the interview that I did with Monty. But the one comment that stands out in regards to our conversation is I had posted the interview that I did with Monty, and there was what looked like, uh, just based on the, the, the profile photo, I don't want to make any specific, um, any specific generalization, but it looked like it was a fairly young Indian girl that I think was overseas. And she commented, oh my God, it's so great that somebody, uh, somebody of color was doing work at this level. I didn't know that was possible. And that blew my mind. Not that what she said was wrong, that somebody could think that way and live in a world where that's how you view it, that it's literally not possible for someone of color to be working at the level that you or Monty are. And that really opened my eyes. I was like, wow, that's yeah. such a different perspective than I ever saw it as. And to me, I thought the, the one thing that I can do personally is I can give somebody the microphone so more people hear your story and say, I didn't think that was possible either. I look just like that. Now I've got a shot, right? Yeah. So it's, I really believe that it's about the people at the top, at the top of the game like you are, sharing your stories, mentoring, which allows more of the people at the bottom to not feel so discouraged. And then slowly the next year, there's 2% of the people in the room. And then the next year, there's 5%. And then the next year, there's 12%, right? So you don't walk into these giant rooms of people and say, God, there's just, there's nobody here that looks like me or knows my backstory or has had a, you know, a similar upbringing. Like to me, that, that's really what helps us move the needle long term. But I'm just trying to do my part to listen as opposed to step in and try and solve everything thing which is that's usually my default is i just want to <laughs> i want to get in and solve the puzzle and i'm like nope this one's not for me to solve i just want to be able to lend a hand um and that 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 was one of the biggest reasons that i wanted to have you here is so people can just hear your story and know that it wasn't easy but you took responsibility for your circumstances that to me is such a big key you just took responsibility and said these are my circumstances this is what i want i'm going to put myself in the place to make sure that people can't say no i love that yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's about never quitting. You know, if you quit, you don't have a chance to do anything. You don't have a chance to have this beautiful life and career. You don't have a chance to have access. You just, you know, you're out of it. And so all your competition or your peers or whatever, they just move forward. So that's, that's, you know, that's a big thing. And thank you for doing your part in illuminating this story. It's important. It's really, really important. And as to that young Indian girl, that's why it's so important for us to be able to connect with all these people that are traditionally out of the system. Because if you can see it and maybe believe it, you can achieve it. And that sparked a dream or something that it reinforced confidence in her that 
We don't know who she's going to grow up to be. She may or may not become a filmmaker or a storyteller, but the fact that she was able to see someone who expanded her, her mind beyond what she thought was the possible, now she had, can see that the realm of possibility, it can happen. And, and we all have a story. So mine is just one. Each one of us has our own story to tell. And so with that in mind, don't, you know, I would say to, you know, our listeners, um, don't necessarily compare your story to mine's because you have a unique story of your own to tell. And that unique story that we all tell is what's our goal, it's what makes us all better as a whole when we go onto these shows and, and you're not just dealing with one, whether it's all male, you need some women in there because they have a point of view. When we're screening these movies or whatever I'm doing, it is super vital, important that we collect a nice round, uh, uh, you know, demographic of who's watching it and what they have to say. It's really, really important. And it's not all incumbent on just the studios or the white directors or producers or showrunners. The African-American directors and producers have to step their game up too. We all do. You know, because there are a lot of movies and TV shows that would, would benefit greatly from our unique point of view and our experiences in life. And for me, this is funny because what I've now learned over the course of probably the last decade when I'm hiring an assistant, I almost treat it like a casting. Like, obviously, I want the person who's best for the job. Everybody should always strive for that. But I'm also looking to help and see who has not been traditionally involved in the pipeline that they're sitting on a gold mine, a wealth of story, and their voice has been muted. So, and I also am looking for, what is, what am I hiring you for? Do you have a knowledge of the type of film or the type of show that I need help on? And, um, and so that's one of the things, I've been really blessed with some great assistants. One of my, I mean, I had a great, uh, two great assistants in New York, uh, my lead guy, Ulysses Guidotti, who just is amazing, and Nolan Jennings, who was my second, and then I've had Augie Rexach and so many others who just wrote a piece about being helpful is sometimes the most important ingredient in a person anticipating the needs of their supervisor. In this case, it's the editor and just being helpful. If you know, if we're digging through dailies for a take and all this coverage comes in and I can't find that particular take, he had a way of just gently, quietly taking down the note, texting it to me while we're in discussion with the director or showrunner. It comes across, I look at my phone and I go, I know where it is. Now, there's two ways to approach that. He could have just piped up out of nowhere and played hero ball which wouldn't have gone over so well with me either. Or he, he definitely quietly did his thing to be helpful. And that was the right way to do it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a lot. And I didn't even, haven't even gotten to tell you the part of the story of how I got to a Ron Howard. Well, and you, you stole my segue because that's exactly what I was going to say is talking about this inspirational story, never quitting. If you can believe it, you can achieve it. It's no coincidence you are now working with Ron Howard. So, yes, let's let's close the loop and talk a little bit more about how you got from there to here. Okay, so a lot of great shows along the way, a lot of hit shows, a lot of fantastic directors, showrunners, writers, people that I've worked with. But I was working on this one show called Hand of God, and uh, it was for Amazon. And they had, there's an editor uh, who was working on it. He was like the supervising editor. His name's um, Stephen Lang. And Okay, uh, but I, I got to stop you here, by the way. Yeah. Stephen Lang is the mentor that got me into the television industry. Get out of here. That's how small this world is. So, wow. yeah, so the, I'm, this would usually be an off the record side conversation, but because it's so relevant to what we're talking about and how important it is to provide value to people and build relationships, Stephen Lang is the one that gave me my shot and got me in the door to interview on Burn Notice when I had no TV credits whatsoever. So, you may continue, but as soon as you said Hand of God, I'm like, oh my God, he's not going to say Steve Lang. There's no way that's possible. Yeah. I swear to everybody listening, you and I did not rehearse this beforehand. <laughs> Had no, no idea this is coming. This is how important relationships are. Yeah, absolutely vital. Because before stepping back one show before that, I was working on Roots with Mario Van Peebles, who we both have shared an experience yep, with. I've, He's I've a worked great with him guy, as well. great director. And uh, we were cutting night two of Roots, and Marty Nicholson and Philip Noyes were cutting night one. Well, Marty, that the Hand of God was one of his regular shows in his rotation. He couldn't leave. Philip was doing multiple projects. He needed to shepherd night one of Roots through because Philip was unavailable a lot of times. And the same thing occurred with me with Mario. He had a couple of other projects going simultaneously. And Marty kept telling me, 
you got to go over the hand of God. You got to go over the hand of God. You need to meet this guy, Ben Watkins. He's a showrunner. You'll love him. He's a great friend of mine. He's wonderful. He is all those things. And he was all those things. And so I go over the hand of God and uh, fill in for just an episode, one episode that they had available. I've talked to Ben, wonderful guy completely one of the most diverse staffs I've ever been a part of. I love anyway, Ben and I've worked with him, by the way, oh, too. That's so, right, because from Burn Notice. Because he was on right. Burn Notice, so I worked that's with right. Ben for four years. Loved the That's guy. right. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I forgot about that with Ben. Yeah, he's fantastic. So to, to not elongate this story out, because it's all a series of these um, – kind of like Lemony Snick, it's a series of fortunate mm-hmm. events. You know, <laughs> instead of it. unfortunate events, it's a series of fortunate events. So I go over, I'm working. Stephen Lang likes my work. He gets a call from Fox Studio about a show called Genius that National Geographic, National Geographic was going to produce. And you know, their bag has been science and nature. So I thought, he tells me, yeah, you know, they're doing this series called Genius. And I immediately thought Science and Nature. And I go, I don't know. That doesn't seem very sexy. You know, like, you know, what are we going to do? An hour picking up rocks or I, I don't know. They do great work. They, I shouldn't say that because that's it's just not, not right. your thing. I get it's, it. It's it's just, not your it thing. just did not the idea. Uh, and he totally didn't sell it right either. So now we cut to our rap party. And Steve tells me, I got a little bit more information about that. Jeffrey Rush is going to be starring as Einstein for the Genius series. And I thought, really? Because that guy's big and he's going to do TV. And I said, okay, great. So, um, you know, you can give them my name over at Fox. That'd be, that'd be more than all right. And so then the next day he comes to me and he tells me, hey, listen, um, I also got word that Ron Howard's going to direct the pilot. I go, are you kidding me? So you, you gave him my name, right? So I get a, <laughs> <laughs> I get a phone call from, from Fox, from Wes Irwin. And he sets up the interview. When I get to the interview over on Sunset Gower Studios for the show, sitting in there is uh, this woman, Anna Culp from Imagine, who's helped me tremendously. It's a great lady, great producer. And uh, Dan Hanley, one of Ron's longtime editors, and Ken Biller, who I, as this comes full circle, we started out talking about Dark Angel, the, the, the connections. He was one of the producer directors on Dark Angel. I come into, into the room not expecting to know anybody, and Ken gives me a big old bear hug when you could still bear hug people. Mm. And uh, he goes, James, when we catch up, the whole, whole thing, we're sitting down talking together. They brought me on with the idea that I was going to co-cut with Dan, the pilot, while Ron was directing. Well, I got hired. All things were set to go. Um, Dan went in a little early to start cutting and he looked at a whole lot of the dailies and there was one particular dinner scene that he saw and it was just the dinner scene that he saw and it was just, um, it was a lot, man. It was just like multiple cameras for probably what turned out to be a four to six minute scene and there must have been hours and hours and hours and hours of footage. And you know, there were 10 people sitting around this dinner table and all sorts of cameras on details of the food and eye lines from this person to that person and, and revolving camera masters and the whole thing, <laughs> a ton. Right. Yeah, I'll, I'll a t- take a gunfight or a fist fight any day yeah. over a dinner table scene. They are the hardest things to cut. Thank you, Zach, for saying that. Because so Dan goes in there and he had just come off of finishing up Inferno with Ron and he looked at the material and I guess he thought, I don't know, man, you know, I'm a little exhausted from Inferno and, you know, I don't know if I can do the best job. He calls me and he goes, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm just enjoying my last moments of freedom before I dive in. (laughs) And he says, well, listen, um, you know, I got to talk to you about something. And I'm like, "Uh oh. What's going on? It's that concerned. I got to talk to you about something. He goes, listen, I can't do the show. Oh, boy. I can't do the show. I'm sorry to dump this on you, but it's all on you, pal. I I feel confident in you that you can do this. And, um, I, you know, I want to do the best job. And the guy, like, I'm I'm literally now going, what? Like, this has been such a, a whirlwind of events from getting hired to working with Ron Howard, potentially, to now solely working with Ron Howard on this pilot. And, um... And I said, oh, okay. Uh, and I was fully ready because I was always cutting pilots and being the lead guy and the whole thing. They just didn't know what I could do because they were coming from the world of features. And Dan had always worked with Mike Hill and it was the three of them, Dan and Mike and Ron. And you know, these guys have won Oscars together and just huge shoes to fill. 
I got in there. I saw these dailies. They were amazing. I was like, oh, I'm in heaven. I can just do my thing. Here's where the Beverly Hills Playhouse uh, acting thing came into play because I was able to go at those performances, um, Emily Watson and Jeffrey Rush and like so many other great actors that I just started cutting and I had a ball. And then I was sending cuts to Ron and Ron goes, James, these cuts are amazing. You're doing a great job. He sent me a text and I still have the text by the way. Um, As you should, it should be framed, printed and framed. I I got several texts from him that I should hold on to for eternity. but yeah, so so that kind of was the beginnings of our working relationship. Cut to the end of the season. Now it's Emmy submission time. All departments are entering. The show ends up with 23 Emmy nominations. It was the most of a first year show ever. Wow. National Geographic is their first real venture into scripted television. So everybody's just super amped and happy about it. Ron gets a, uh, a directing. Uh, an Emmy nod for directing and uh, and everybody everybody got a nomination except me oh. and I thought oh this 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 doesn't feel good that's at not all. cool no no I was ticked I'm gonna As tell you, you I been. was ticked I was not anyone to talk to for a good solid week or two then I was working on another show after that and this editor Jane Cass says I saw your work on Genius and you know, you should submit for an Ace Eddie Award. And I go, I'm not a part of Ace. I don't, you know, how can I do that? She goes, don't worry about it. That's not a requirement. I will go through, I'll help you get involved. I'll help you with the submission, the whole thing. I did, I submitted, and guess what? I won. Nicely done, congratulations. I won. It was it was one of the most amazing nights of my life and obviously of my career. And uh, I didn't get played off the stage during my acceptance speech. <laughs> Doesn't happen was, at the, the Eddies, right? Yeah, just it was it was fantastic. And so that began our relationship with Imagine Entertainment and with Ron Howard. And um, and since then, we kind of made a pact to go on and work together. I did season two of Genius, which was with Antonio Banderas on Picasso. And that did really well. Another got a lot of Emmy uh, nominations for that one as well. And um, and then after that, they sent me a couple of scripts over on different projects to take a look at and see what I would do. And the one project that really stood out to me, which was something traditionally I wouldn't gravitate towards that material because it was like a, a Southern Gothic drama. It's called Filthy Rich that just came out on Fox this year. But the director was Tate Taylor. And I thought, wow, that's that's big. You know, they got a feature guy directing this. He wrote it, the whole thing. So I go over to Fox Lot, I meet with him, I got my resume, the whole thing, and Anna jokes with me about this because she set up the whole coordinating of everything. She goes, yeah, you were sitting there, you had your resume all ready to go and looking for an opening to present it to Tate, and he never (laughs) asked you for it. And he finally just goes, we're eating crab cakes. And he goes, well, listen, man, I like you. You want to do this job? (laughs) <laughs> I was like, of course I want to do the job. Okay, well, then you got to go to New Orleans. I'll see you in New Orleans. Okay, so can we get the bill? Let's go. And that's how that went. Like, I had this big formal meeting in mind, and it was Tate and his partner, John, and I got hired on the spot. Now, we get down to New Orleans. I see Anna one night. Uh, me and my assistant are walking down the street, and I, I said, let's go down the street to one of the bars down there and grab a night night, you know, uh, cocktail um, before we head in. We go down there, we see Anna, and she's telling me, Tate just loves working with you. He absolutely loves working with you. He loves your performance choices. The cuts are going well. He thinks he's not going to have a whole lot of work to do when he comes in. And so, James, I'm so happy that you're part of this, the whole thing. I said, great. And then I said to her, you know, before we go, I just wanted to let you know, I would love the opportunity to work with Ron again on anything. So they had this project, 68 Whiskey, that was coming up that uh, it was like, uh, I think, an Israeli ap- adaptation of, you know, the wartime and nurses and doctors and the whole thing. But Ron was supposed to direct that. So she goes, I'll talk to him about that. While I was waiting for him to respond to that, Hillbilly Elegy came into play. It just zoomed right past 68 Whiskey. He was no longer going to direct 68 Whiskey. He now had turned all his sights on directing Hillbilly Elegy. And I'm reading about it in the trades, and I'm finding out Amy Adams is the lead, who I've been telling my wife forever, she's just money. She is so great. Like, anything that she does is just gold. 
then Glenn Close is a part of it. And then Haley Bennett is a part of it. And this other guy, Gabriel Basso, who I didn't know his work, but he's been fantastic. Anyway, conversations are had. The next thing you know, I'm being sent the script for Hillbilly Elegy. Ron calls me on a Saturday morning. We're talking, you know, he says to me like, uh, so, you know, if you were, if, if I were to go with you, would you mind working in New York? Not a problem. Um, if, if I were to go with you, would you mind working with another editor? Cause I'm used to working with several editors, not a problem. So he goes, okay, James, this is all great. We had a wonderful experience on genius, albeit brief, but why don't we talk again soon? I'm in a van scouting. So I'll call you on Tuesday. I'm still doing the pilot with Tate. I'm back in Los Angeles, out of Louisiana now, and I'm waiting. Tuesday comes. I don't hear anything. Tuesday goes. I'm like, ah. now cut to Wednesday. Tate and I are still working. And um, I hadn't heard anything. I'm like, I ah, probably went with somebody else. Now cut to that Thursday. And Tate tells me, he goes, well, Ron Howard called me about you. <laughs> and I could do nothing but tell him the truth and gave you a glowing recommendation. Tate, I love you. That is so great. So now, um, Thursday, I don't hear anything. Then Friday. And I had another interview that, another show really that was waiting on an answer for me as to whether or not I was going to come on board. So I had this other HBO project. I had Tate in the meantime, I'm cutting with him. And he goes, well, if Ron doesn't hire you, I'm going to hire you for this other film I have coming up. We just hit it off and connected super well. Friday, Ron sends me a text. James, let's do this. Another frameable one. You're going to need a whole wall Let's of Ron Howard text messages. So uh, before you knew it, the night that I got inducted into ACE, which was June 3rd, I think it was, 2019, several hours later, I was on a plane to New York to begin work on the 5th. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. New York in all its glory, the heat of the summer, the plays, the theater, uh, sporting events, all these things, great work, great dailies, incredible project, pandemic hits, life changes. Wow, that is quite the story, my friend, quite the story. Um, as uh, editors, uh, we, we pride ourselves on our ability to manage time. And I find that just about every single episode, I always, I always end up going longer than I want to because the stories are so good. Um, so I don't want to take up your time any longer than I said I would. But I, I want to I end in, uh, in one place. Mm -hmm. if, if somebody listening now is, and this is kind of reiterating what I mentioned earlier, thinking all of that's great and I'm happy that all of those things happened for James. None of that stuff is ever going to happen to me. It's just never going to happen. I don't think that I can make the transitions that I want, or I don't think that anybody's going to give me the chance to tell my stories because of the color of my skin. What do you tell them? How, how do we get them to the point where they do the work that's necessary so they can tell their stories, so they can put themselves in the right place at the right time, so nobody has the opportunity to ever say no to them? Well, I would say this. Number one, don't have that attitude that it's never going to happen. Because if you don't believe it's going to happen, it may never happen. So don't block your own blessings. That's number one. Whatever you desire to do, effort that. Whether it's for whether you're being paid or whether you're not being paid. If you want to go to features, look at a ton of movies. Talk to feature editors. Hang out with them. Read scripts that are widely available online. Figure out what happened from the script to screen. All these things. And... Um, I would say that don't always expect your payoff to come from the place that you're investing in. So sometimes things pay off down the line. And if you see my whole career, it was a series of breaks and game changing breaks and, and just being ready and thoroughly prepared for what's to come next. And so I kind of felt my way through it from decision making and preparation. And that's what a lot of people's story is going to be. You don't always get the opportunity to go, look, I put in so much work as an assistant on this show. And so therefore that's the show that should recognize my efforts and make me an, an, an editor. I should get bumped up on that editor. It might, as an editor, it might not come until one or two shows later. And so you just got to stay in there. You got to keep grinding. You got to keep believing and you got to keep preparing um, no matter what, because it's going to happen. 
right now in this very moment, I have four people after I hang up with you who are sitting on game changing opportunities from either assistance to getting into that chair or from VFX cutting to going into that chair, whatever it is right now, Hollywood is casting a wider net than I've ever seen movement on. And if you're ready to go and you're committed and other people can see that, I think that the opportunity will come. You know, I don't have a, I don't have a GPS for any particular person on how to get there, except know what you want to do along the way. Try not to get pigeonholed, learn anything you don't know, and don't give anyone a reason to say no to you. I started in news. I transitioned out of that to a freelance editor. I transitioned out of that from music and music videos and commercials to uh, eventually getting into scripted drama. And then the opportunity came for me to work in comedy with Damon Wayans and Chris Rock. And I learned under those great comedians. And then I went back into drama. And all those skills I use in every aspect of what I'm doing because there's great drama in comedy and there can be great comedy in drama. So it's the whole toolkit now that has prepared me for where I am right now. So I would say that is the thing. Just keep diversifying your career and trying, to, to, trying your very best to develop your craft. You never stop learning, which is fantastic. We're in a business where we can continue to grow and develop our craft. I couldn't have said any of that better myself. And there's one thing that I, I want to just expand on a little bit because I think it's so important and I want to make sure people don't overlook it. It's this idea that what you're doing right now may not pay off immediately. I think that's the one of the biggest reasons that people get discouraged. Well, I tried this. It didn't work. So I guess that was a bad idea. And the reason I bring it up is I just had this conversation with Debbie this morning, who is the whole reason that you and I are on this call in the first place. We have a mutual friend, editor Debbie Germino. And I was talking to her on a Zoom call today, and we were talking through different job opportunities. And I brought up this thing called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Are you familiar with this? Is that the experiment where you can have two if you wait or one? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. in 1972, there was an experiment at Stanford where they took kids and they put them in a room. And they said, you can either have a marshmallow now, or if you wait 15 minutes, we'll give you two marshmallows. And if you're talking to a five-year-old kid, like 15 minutes, that is an eternity to wait for a marshmallow. <laughs> but the important thing is what they found is that they studied them until they were adults. And there was a very direct correlation between those that were willing to delay gratification and those that were successful. So for anybody that says, well, I tried that. It didn't work. I guess that was stupid. I'm going to go back to what I was doing before. you got to see through the lens of the, this game being chess and not checkers. And that's exactly what your career was at the time. It's like, well, did that checkers move? I guess that didn't pay off, but let's wait two years. Let's mm -hmm. wait three years. Let's wait five years. How did the chess move pay off? And that's because you were so well prepared, but you were so good at managing and maintaining these relationships. So I want to make sure people really understand how important that is to the core foundation of your story, because anybody can control that. They can't replicate your version of the story. Nobody has the GPS. But if you find the foundational fundamental steps that you've taken, I really believe that everyone's journey is incredibly similar as long as you break it down to those steps. And that's a big one. You have to be willing to delay gratification and sometimes say no, even though yes seems like the better answer right now because no gets you where you want to get in the long term. Yeah. So I think that's that's such an important point that you made. So. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I still continue to practice that same thing and I'm learning all the time. And, uh, you know, that's, that just goes back to never quitting. That's the athletic side of me. The worst thing that you can do in sports is considered to quit. And so maybe I've been pigheaded in some ways, <laughs> a lot of times where I should have left a bad job earlier or whatever, but there's always something to learn from all of those experiences. And I'll tell you this, lastly, I would say this, you know, as successful as my career has been, and I, I've covered a lot of ground and done and had an amazing career and met some really unique and special people and, and experiences that I don't know if I would have ever had outside of this industry. Um, you know, I, 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 I I, I just have to say that, wow, I mean, it's, it's been pretty incredible. And, I, and for all of that, I've never thought of myself as being great. I've left whatever has been said to me or about me to others. So I don't, I've never, what, I guess what I'm saying is I did not stamp my own passport. I prepared my passport for stamping, but I let other people talk about how good, if he's great, he's, he's the one you want. 
hit, you'll love them. I let other people say that. So because of that, I didn't rush myself into thinking that my immediate gratification of an opportunity was sanctioned by myself only. Because sometimes we're not as good as we think we are. Or we're not as prepared as we believe we are. Sometimes it takes other people in that recommendation to say, you know, I have a person in mind for you. It, it's, you know, you do all you can do, obviously, to be prepared. But um, part of it was the, the duality of being ambitious and patient. I cannot tell you what a pleasure it has been chatting today. And dear Lord, when this pandemic is over, you and I need to be new best friends and we need to go out and grab a beer or whatever your drink is of choice. And we just need to like chill out and talk shop because this has been like one of the most enjoyable hour and 15 minutes of my life. This would, I, you, I can't even imagine how much fun it would be to share a wall with you and cut a show together. My God, would that be fun? Um, but in the meantime, uh, I want to make sure that if anybody listening today is either younger, breaking into the industry, or maybe even not breaking in, but struggling. And they say, this sounds like somebody that's willing to help me learn, mentor, ask questions. How can people find you and get a hold of you and connect? Well, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. You can call the Editors Guild. I'm on various committees there. You can reach me through the Directors Guild. Um, when this podcast comes out, they may reach to you that you could connect us together. And I'm, I'm a resource when my time is uh, available. You know, I, I, I'll help anybody, quite honestly, is the truth. You know, I, I, you know, right now the focus is on African Americans and diversity and whatever that means, women, uh, people of color, but I've helped so many people along the way that I just feel like it's important to pay it forward because I got a lot of help and a lot of help from various different type, types of people of all races and ethnic backgrounds and the whole thing. And that's why I mentioned some of those names because to honor them, um, because I, I have gotten a lot of help from people who have recognized my commitment to the craft or, or, or just being the best person you can be, or just someone who, you know, I live by the golden rule. So I've treated people hopefully as well as I've wished to be treated. So yeah, if they want to get in touch with me, that would be the way to do it. I'm like I said, I'm on all, all the various social media platforms, Twitter. Um, I'm not on TikTok. I, I don't know anything about that. Yeah, me, but, me too. I'm too old for that. I can't yeah, that stuff out. Yeah, Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, my friend, let me tell you this. I'm humbled and honored to be one of your guests in this esteemed list of guests of people that you've had and you've interviewed over the course of the years. And I strongly sanction and, and completely support 100% what you advocate in this craft of cutting and storytelling because it's so important. I have these discussions all the time about comfortable places to work, environments that are conducive to great work, limiting the hours, better management, better managing the humans on who are exacted to do these jobs. And so um, thank you for being a strong voice and advocate for that because it's important. You know, there was a lot about Hollywood that was not working and we should, we should fix everything while we're out here fixing things. Let's get well, it all. That, that means, uh, means a tremendous amount to me. That really does. That means a lot that you said that. Um, and I, I think I'm going to have to hit the stop button before I choke up. <laughs> uh, so, so on that note, I want to thank you for uh, being here today, prioritizing the time to share your knowledge. Anybody that's listening, you want to connect with James. He's given the blessing. You reach out to me. You reach out to him. We will make it happen, time permitting. So, James, thank you so much for making this happen today. Can't thank you enough. And I will say this before we go. If it's about work, you can always call my agency, UTA, Jason Garber. There you go. Excellent. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. Zach, my pleasure.